We're going to get started on the third session, so if you could please be seated and I will um, start with the introductions. This third session's title is Dynamics of Mission. And today we've got with us Eliza Kent, who is Chair and Professor of Religious Studies at Skidmore College. Um, Eliza Kent is a graduate of the Divinity School here. She got her PhD in History of Religions, and um, from there she uh, worked at in the, in the Department of Religion at Colgate and for 10 years, from 2003 to 2013, and then she moved uh, to Skidmore College where she played a formative role in building the Religious Studies Department. Um, her publications are formidable. She's published a monograph called uh, Sacred Groves and Local Gods, Religion and Environmentalism in South India, uh, which was published in 2013. She also published a text, a monograph, Converting Women, Gender and Christianity in Colonial South India, uh, which was published from Oxford University Press in 2004, and received an award for the best book in Hindu Christian studies um, from the Society for Hindu Christian Studies. And finally, she's co-edited a volume uh, with Tazim Kassam, entitled Lines in Water, Religious Boundaries in South Asia. Her talk today is entitled Gender and Power in the Charismatic Space. Please join me in welcoming Eliza Ken. Oh, thank you so much. I just want to reiterate what other people have said, that it is such a pleasure to be here. And I really want to thank the organizers and all the people that have um, helped to put this conference together, including the folks that come and are the audience that makes a, a, a conference like this possible. Um, you know, it's, I'm going to begin with a little bit of an autobiography about my experiences at the University of Chicago, and it's all, what's been so amazing to me about the presentation so far is just, um, you know, putting that that uh, autobiographical material, in a sense, into this incredible historical context. So, in 1995, or thereabouts, when I first announced to my graduate school advisor, Wendy Doniger, that I wanted to do field research for my dissertation on Protestant women missionaries in India, it created something of a fracas in Swift Hall. And I don't want to exaggerate the extent or scope of the fracas that it made, but it made a big impression on me as a somewhat insecure graduate student. And what sparked it was that it was not only I, but actually several others in my cohort who had also expressed an interest um, in pursuing study of Christianity within the history of religions track. Of course, then as now, the Dib School has many academic tracks which focus on Christianity, theology, church history, and Bible among them. But history of religions, which had long allied itself intellectually with anthropology, saw itself primarily as the study of other people's religions. And of course, the presumed self in that configuration was generally Christian or Jewish. A cluster of students proposing dissertations on Christianity in this track set off alarm bells. Why? Many different arguments were advanced to discourage myself and others. There were political arguments. Christian missionaries were essentially the shock troops of colonialism. So why should I spend my time telling their stories? I protested that the only way to tell the long neglected stories of Indian women evangelists was to learn the stories of the women they worked for and alongside in a move that has become standard in a shift from mission history to church history and church history to world Christianity. There was also an argument about lineage. Anthropologists could undertake properly critical studies of missionaries and the localized forms of Christianity created out of the missionary encounter as the charismatic power couple then in Haskell Hall, Jean and John Komaroff were doing in such an exemplary fashion. But I was told too many historians of religions were ex-missionaries or the children of missionaries to undertake these investigations in an appropriately neutral, objective fashion. The threat that one's own research project was entangled with the goal of advancing global Christian evangelization aroused an intensely worried defensiveness about crypto-Christianity. And again, we've been fascinated to kind of hear resonances of that so far earlier. Another objection was more aesthetic, at least on the surface. If you are going all the way to India or Mozambique or to Brazil, etc., why study Christianity, which was boring? in comparison to these other traditions. In retrospect, I think that this was a blunt expression of what Joel Robbins has termed the continuity bias in anthropology and the history of religions, which valued the putatively authentic indigenous 
as a legacy of a moral commitment to rescue or at least preserve knowledge of cultures endangered by modernity. Nowadays, the swarm of hybrids spawned by modernity are much beloved by anthropologists and historians of religions, but this was 1995. The final and most worrying objection was practical. You will never get a job with a dissertation on Indian Christianity. Schools looking to hire specialists in Christianity want people trained in theology, church history, and Bible. Schools looking to hire someone to teach Indian religions want someone to teach Hinduism or Buddhism, Jainism, and so on. The truth was they were right on that score. It took me many years on the adjunct and the VAP track before I got a tenure track job at Colgate, a good one. Uh, and unfortunately, my sense is that the largely tradition-centered hiring practices of religion departments are still very much intact today. Is anyone training graduate students and trying to find them jobs in the job market? I think knows. Of course, I stuck to my research project, whether out of a lack of imagination or just plain stubbornness. And nowadays, I get to be on the other side of this teacher-student dynamic as a guide of undergraduate thesis writers who continually ignore my advice. Um, I'm reminded of a New Yorker cartoon that Wendy Doniger had on her door that showed a stoop-shouldered, bespectacled, balding Icarus, complete with drooping wings, standing before his mother who was seated and knitting an afghan. And the caption read, go ahead Icarus, fly to the sun. Your wings will melt and you will crash and die. But what do I know? I'm just your mother. <laughs> When an academic subfield is emerging, whether feminist or media studies, material religion, or world Christianity, you need a few Icaruses determined to launch themselves deaf to all warnings. But no matter how hard they flap, they will fall unless they can catch some wind under their wings. I feel very privileged today to be among so many distinguished contributors to the field of world Christianity who have been the wind for me and so many countless others. Thank you. About the time when I was anxiously arguing with my advisors in Swift Hall in the mid-1990s, one of the pioneering anthropologists, feminist anthropologists of Christianity, Elizabeth Brusco, identified a distinctive pattern in the gender dynamics among urban poor Colombians. Coined the Pentecostal gender bargain by fellow feminist anthropologist Bernice Martin, it entailed the adoption of complementary gender roles within the family, according to which women formally submit to the authority of husbands in exchange for increased material and social security, while men relinquish the freedom to participate in machismo cultures of swearing, smoking, fighting, drinking, and adultery in exchange for a new role as family patriarch. According to Brusco and Martin, Pentecostal men submit to their own domestication because adherence to strict Pentecostal rules provides a dignified way out of self-destructive machismo culture. More than just keeping them out of hospital or out of jail, however, involvement in Pentecostal churches gives men a new authoritative role in the center of the family. Brusco argues that the main motivator for arriving at this bargain is political economy. The rapidly changing economic conditions of Latin America in the late 20th century included the pro proletarianization of the workforce and the diminishing significance of production within the household. As a result, women kept out of the wage labor force by discrimination or responsibility for child rearing became even more economically dependent on men. Today, the economic factors pushing people towards patriarchal nuclear family forms continue with the consolidation of neoliberalism everywhere and its shredding of public safety nets and, the elevation, and its elevation of individualism. Brusco and Martin's observations are more relevant than ever. Although it shocked many feminists at the time, Brusco's declaration that Pentecostal Christianity constitutes a strategic women's movement provided a better answer to the question of why women in such large numbers around the world would be drawn to a religion that seems to denigrate them and limit their freedom. In some ways, Brusco and Martin anticipated the influential work of Sabah Mahmoud on the Isla Islamic revival of the 1990s, another global religious movement roughly contemporaneous with the surge in Pentecostal and charismatic Christianity. Mahmoud saw in women's participation in the lay piety movements in Cairo a mode of empowerment very different from that envisioned by the liberal and Marxist political thought that undergirds much Western feminism. 
What Mahmoud, Rusko, and Martin have in common is a view of women's empowerment that regards respect and security within a network of relationships as more desirable, more capable of creating the conditions for flourishing than the capacity for autonomous self-expression long valued by both leftist progressives and liberal political philosophy. Scholars seeking to attend to the place of gender in such global religious movements still have a lot to learn from this research, I would argue. But even if we grant that Pentecostalism has helped empower women, we need to understand in a more fine-grained way how norms governing gender are actually changed in what Annalyn Erickson has termed the charismatic space. How are subjectivities retrained, norms revalued, within the context of Pentecostal ritual and everyday life? While Erickson defines the charismatic space in which, as where the spirit reveals itself for believers, I argue that it is not just in the context of emotionally intense rituals that these kinds of spirit-guided transformations happen. One of my arguments today is that research on Pentecostalism needs to pay more attention to the personal networks established by these churches, which I contend are the most important lines along which missionization happens. Though much attention has been paid to the global networks that have effectively spread Pentecostal varieties around the world, not as much attention has been paid to the local networks along which the powerful emotions catalyzed in congregational worship are reactivated in the intimate context of the home and are translated into action at the level of everyday emotional and material support. What recent research in India suggests is that for women Pentecostals, as important or perhaps more important than the strengthening of the marital bond that Brusco and Martin attend to, is a strengthening and broadening of a network of female friends and associates. Almost every aspect of the history of the spread and development of Pentecostal and charismatic Christianity defies clear definition. According to a widely cited survey by the Pew Research Center in 2011, as many as a quarter of Christians around the world can today be identified as Pentecostal or charismatic. These statistics must be tempered, however, with the recognition that, as Alan Anderson has argued, they capture a dizzying range of different churches and communities under the umbrella term of Pentecostal or charismatic. Anderson identifies three broad types of Pentecostalism in the global context, and many of you may be familiar with this, but get us all on the same page. Uh, first, classical Pentecostals associated with denominations that originated in the US, like the Church of God in Christ and the Assemblies of God. Second, the charismatic renewal movement that swept through mainline Protestant denominations and the Roman Catholic Church starting in the 1970s and the myriad and incredibly variegated independent Pentecostal or Pentecostal-like churches in Africa, Asia, Oceania, and Latin America. The ritual practices and theologies of these churches vary dramatically. For a long time, many people regarded speaking in tongues as the sine qua non of Pentecostalism. However, many scholars have come to see this as an unwarranted universalization of the doctrinal position of classical Pentecostals, for whom glossolalia is required as evidence of a second baptism and therefore of genuine conversion. A more inclusive definition begins with the recognition that the manifestation of the experience of the gifts of the Holy Spirit takes different forms, prophecy, exorcism, healing, and glossolalia, along, I would argue, with forms of ecstasy shaped by local cultures, such as possession by the Virgin Mary, or the experience, the sensation of being bathed in fire. These are variously emphasized, depending on social historical context. And as is well known, these charismata are typically accompanied by an emotionally expressive, somatically intense ritual style that both invites the presence of the Holy Spirit and provides an implicitly agreed upon form for its sensation. Swaying, singing and swooning, dancing and raising one's hands in the air. The proliferation of these gestures throughout the congregation during a service provides a measure for the participants of that highly sought after presence. As anthropology, anthropologist of religion Birgit Meyer writes, these churches do not only generate, but also heat up and intensify religious feelings. 
Pentecostal services, she writes, are powerful, sensational forms that seek to involve believers in such a way that they sense the presence of God in a seemingly immediate manner and are amazed by his power, unquote. The Pentecostal emphasis on the immediate presence of the Holy Spirit and its sensation yields a syncretic style and a robust, both a syncretic style and a robust instantiation of the Protestant ideal that the church is a priesthood of all believers, where each and every Christian is empowered to manifest the gifts of God and spread the gospel. This is what gives Pentecostal Christianity its viciparous, polycentric character as well, as it endorses improvisation and creativity within a rough shared framework. In a very simplistic sense then, the rapid global spread of the movement can be explained by the fact that Pentecostals do not wait for official missionaries to take up the work of evangelization. They go forth and witness themselves. The growth of Pentecostal and charismatic churches is often characterized as explosive a ma metaphor that conjures up not just the rapid spread of the tradition, but also its destruction of what laid in its path. Long indigenized and politically entrenched forms of Roman Catholicism in Central and South America, indigenous religions in Africa and Melanesia, and culturally embedded forms of Roman Catholicism and mainline Protestantism in all the above places and in India. The rhetoric and rituals of rupture that Birgit Meyer has illuminated so brilliantly play a large role in creating this image of Pentecostalism as a destructive force, especially when combined with a linear narrative of its history, from William Seymour's Azusa Street Church in Los Angeles, date stamped April 1906, to its seemingly unstoppable global dispersion. One of the contributions of global Christianity, of world Christianity, has been to counter this with a history of polycentric multiple origins that makes visible indigenous agency in the localization of Christianity even at the height of 19th and early 20th century European colonialism. Historian Michael Burgunder argues that we can reconcile these two competing historical narratives, the sort of linear with Azusa Street as the epicenter and the polycentric, by putting Pentecostal history into a global context. Thus we can see that Pentecostalism is quote, neither a creed, an institution, nor a place, but a vast and vague international network, unquote, made up of people, conferences, and media. From a historical perspective, quote, everything we count as Pentecostal must be connected within a vast diachronic network that goes back to the beginning of Pentecostalism, unquote. And that beginning has no single point of origin. Seen in this sense, Azusa Street was the prelude to Pentecostalism. In fact, one of many preludes. Pentecostalism itself only really came into being when a global <coughs> Pentecostal network was established, which Burgunder points to or locates as early as 1908. One such prelude to Pentecostalism was the Mukti mission in Western India led by a truly remarkable individual, Pandita Ramabai. Her history and contribution deserve more in-depth investigation than the scattered references one finds in histories of global Pentecostalism and much more than I can share today. Briefly, after achieving fame as a social reformer working to uplift Brahmin widows, she converted to Anglicanism and opened a mission institute in the foothills of Kedgaon, 100 kilometers from the cosmopolitan center of Pune. When famine struck the region, as it did regularly across India in the 19th century, hundreds of traumatized survivors took refuge in her mission. By 1900, the Mukti mission housed 2,000 residents, mostly impoverished, low-caste women, whom the mission hoped to, quote, uplift, the rhetoric of the day, using, uh, through education and vocational training. But what hagiographers of Pentecostalism zero in on are a series of outbreaks of charismatic phenomena that occurred in 1906, 1905 to 1906 in the midst of heightened millennial expectation among missionaries around the world. The first outbreak, reported by Minnie Abrams, uh, an American associate of uh, Pandita Ramabai, was in June 1905, 10 months before the Azusa Street Revival, when a matron came upon a dormitory of girls weeping, praying, and confessing their sins, while well, one girl in their midst testified that she had been woken from her sleep by powerful sensation of being bathed in fire. 
At this time, when so many different aspects of the conversion of Indian Christians was met with skepticism by both white Christian and Indian non-Christian observers, it is not surprising that Abrams and Ramabai absorbed the message that there was a clear form which such extraordinary sensations had to take in order to distinguish the genuine action of the Holy Spirit from superstitious heathenism. Many felt that what happened in 1905 fell short of the Pentecost described in the Book of Acts. When Abrams and Ramabai read news about the Azusa Street Revival in the pages of the Apostolic Faith, a newsletter originating out of the Azusa Street Church whose circulation just exploded in the course of like 10 months to a year, when they read the news in the Apostolic Faith, they humbly acknowledged that, quote, the deeper fullness of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost accompanied by the gift of tongues had not yet been received at Mukti and they encouraged congregants to tarry, which I interpret as code for our charismata are no, just not good enough. <laughs> and predictably, before long, the gift of, gift of tongues descended on the Mukti mission as well. Thanks to Pandita Ramabai's international network of donors and supporters and Abram's tireless publicity, the Mukti mission thus emerged as a new center of Pentecostal fervor receiving visits from missionaries from all over the world who traveled onwards, carrying the form of Pentecostal ecstatic worship to new places. This one Indian example illustrates the usefulness of Burgunda's definition of Pentecostalism as a network, but it additionally reveals that influence did not and does not flow equally along it. Specifically, the girl's experience of the Holy Spirit is a bath of fire, though to my eyes a perfectly adequate interpretation of the descent of fire described in Acts 2 was not ever widely confirmed as a genuine outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Rather, it was only acknowledged when it took the form as recognized by white Pentecostals. Following Burgunder, I view Pentecostalism as a global network composed of innumerable nodes of influence in which the process of, the, which the process of missionization extends, alternately producing local forms and bringing those into alignment with normative forms. Doing so helps reveal the re striking polycentricity of Pentecostal and charismatic Christianity. Wherever authority figures seek to erect some singular structure, church, media network, or theology, the irrepressible dynamics of what Christians theorize as the Holy Spirit bubbles up and leads to the creation of new centers. What I'd like to do in what follows is twofold. One is to look at this incredibly dynamic pro polycentric process of missionization while holding another lens that, that examines how at a local level it authorizes new forms of the expression of gender. For example, in his extraordinary, ethnographer to be, his extraordinary ethnography to be cared for, Nate Roberts describes the dozen or more Pentecostal churches in a northern Chennai slum he calls Kushnaputnam, which means, translates, it's a pseudonym that means like trouble town. And each of these Pentecostal churches had two names. The formal official name painted on a sideboard outside the church was something like Apostolic Liberation Divine Assembly or loving prayer house. But residents of the slum rarely used those names. Rather, they referred to Samuel's church, or Yesudasan's church, or sometimes just Samuel, Yesudasan. This close identification of the church with its male pastor was fitting because, as he writes, a slum church was not only the pastor's personal property, but his life's work the worldly manifestation of his God-given spirit powers and in many ways an extension of himself." Unquote. These independent Pentecostal pastors worked tirelessly to attract parishioners, often from one another's flocks or from those of the Church of South India or Roman Catholic churches. And, to, and he also sought to resource the simple thatch, thatch and pole structures that constitute the physical church with ceiling fans and cordless microphones. An influential narrative in contemporary India portrays Pentecostal churches as lavishly supported by American Christian donors, thus reinforcing the sense that present-day Indian Christians are somehow alien within or traitors to the Indian nation, which is increasingly identified as Hindu, and Hindu, moreover, in a kind of Modi-era conservative modern Brahminical Hinduism. 
This narrative fuels a steady stream of daily acts of violence against Indian Pentecostals, as Chad Bauman has documented. But what his and Robert's research reveals is that the vast majority of these independent Pentecostal churches are self-funded. Indeed, they operate on a bare bones level that really doesn't require much in the way of material investment. But what, because what really powers the church, what the real engine of church growth is, is not money, let alone foreign money, nor even the charisma, charisma of the male pastor, but quasi-autonomous quasi -autonomous organized networks of church women bound to one another through prayer. In a pattern that many other scholars of Pentecostalism has noted, but not deeply investigated, these networks of women who move through the slum from Monday to Friday praying for women complement the work of, charismatic, of the charismatic male pastor, although that is not openly acknowledged by pastor-centric public rhetoric that focuses on the powers of the preacher to prophesy and heal. Because of their reliance on written sources and formal interviews, scholars of Pentecostalism too often reproduce that public rhetoric. I think what really distinguishes Roberts' ethnography is his method. He spent about 15 months just living in, in the slum, uh, talking to people and observing people in both ritual and everyday context, not reading newsletters or giving, you know, having important interviews with important big shots, but just living along people and seeing them inside and outside of church. The result is a fine-grained analysis that gets us closer to understanding how personal networks among women subtly alter the discourse and relationship dynamics surrounding wives in the slum. According to Roberts, women in Kashtaputnam are a particularly tight bind. Because of the geographical isolation of the slum, most women do not work outside the home and are utterly dependent on their husband's wages. And yet, the Tamil Hindu discourse of wifely auspiciousness considered ho considers household well-being, whether measured in terms of health, cleanliness, or absence of discord, as a function of women's spiritual and domestic labor. Another, so they're incredibly responsible for the well-being of the household and yet utterly dependent on their husband's uh, very small wages. Another important element of women's lives are the usurious money lending circles that almost all women engage in to make ends meet, which monetize personal relationships in a way that can cause a lot of strife. And these circles are, are lauded in a lot of places as kind of microfinance schemes, but, uh, but um, Roberts, among others, has identified the, the kind of strife and harm they can also cause. When it comes to the success or failure of any individual church in the, slum, in the slum, charismatic gifts of the male pastor are not negligible, but women play a crucial role even in the high voltage day-long Sunday performances of preaching, prophesying, and healing that are the signature of Pentecostal ritual the world over. For during services, it is women's enthusiastic responses that raise the energy level of the room. Their shouts of hallelujah, their ecstatic swaying and swooing, their coming forward to be healed are in fact the implicitly agreed upon index of the preacher's power as a conduit for God's presence. But where Erickson, in her excellent study of gender and Pentecostalism in Vanuatu, restricts her understanding of the charismatic space where gender is both performed and negotiated to such public rituals, I propose that the charismatic space includes the network of relationships crafted by women's prayer bands. These are cadres of dedicated church women who support each male pastor. And during the week, these prayer teams systematically visit all the houses of the congregation and others, Hindu or Christian, inviting them to pray. The publicly acknowledged purpose of these house visits constitutes one more formal acknowledgement of male pastoral authority, insofar as this is how the personal prayer appeals that constitute part of the pastor's Sunday performances are collected. And yet, in the process of regularly talking to women about their lives and praying over their problems and asking them to pray for women who might be suffering even more than they are, women assuage the silent, isolated suffering of those who may be alienated from each other because of the usurious practices of the lending circles described earlier. In the process, they create a new moral community whose core ethos is that Christians should actively take on the sufferings of others as Christ took on the woe of the world. 
Roberts argues that they come to see that as wives they are not solely responsible for household well-being, as the competing discourse of wifely auspiciousness maintains, but rather that they belong in a circle of care. Through their ceaseless house-to-house -house visitings, they gradually bring newcomers into the fold. And this kind of intensely local network-driven conversion is a far cry from the mass open-air rallies, the prayer crusades led by famous preachers that many associate with worldwide Pentecostal expansion and what Hindu nationalists think conversion entails. Do I have a minute more? Yes. Am I over my time? OK. Um, when we consider the place of missions in global Christianity, a lot of issues come to mind. And again, I wrote this before I, I heard uh, Professor Roberts' excellent presentation, so many of the ones today. But the, the ethics of proselytization, the entwinement of missionary endeavors with empire from the Spanish conquest of the New World to the settlement of the American West, and the pacification of Indians through forced assimilation on Indian reservations, the, the intertwining of empire and, and Christianity in India. The echoes of that history still reverberate in the present moment, particularly in the resentment against Christians and Christian evangelization in places that were subject to this kind of imperial Christianity. The echoes of this history are also felt within the hallowed halls of academia as well. For example, in the resistance to the anthropology of Christianity as a subdiscipline, or to historians of religion taking up the, the topic of, of Christianity around the world, where it took a long time to people to recognize that there might be more, ga more gained from looking at the people who embrace Christianity, even under these violent conditions, as agents rather than entirely as passive victims. The need to train our attention on the agency of converts remains, I would argue, not in a naive sense that they are masters of their own destiny, because none of us are free from the constraints of the culturally produced discourses and social structures that we find ourselves embedded in, but because, those, but because within those structuring structures, one does see a capacity to act freely to world worlds worth living in. Thanks, Eliza, for that insightful paper and also for giving me some insights into this institution as well.